All right, well, I'm going to uh, mostly read my talk and we'll be moving through a series of slides. Um, greetings to everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, I'd like to express my thanks to the organizers of this seminar. I only wish the, uh, we had the chance to convene together and I hope that I'll be able to meet many of you at some point in the near future. Also, thanks to those who have contributed to the series of fascinating talks on such a wide range of topics. I've learned much and the presentations and discussions afterwards have helped me think in new ways about ancient woodworking, including about objects that I've looked at, and in some cases written about many times uh, over the years. Just a, a, a few um, words about my background and why I'm interested in this topic. I took some time off after my undergraduate education and worked as an apprentice uh, to a framing carpenter here in northern New England, where I'm speaking today, from where I'm speaking today. We were working on uh, a traditional timber framed house, and I learned much from that team. This experience, in addition to my academic interest in Roman architecture, led me to examine ancient upper floor systems. The Latin term is contignatio. I examined buildings from Pompeii, Herculaneum, and Ostia to explore that particular topic. And I was particularly interested in seeing if there was evidence of standard timber dimensions uh, used by builders or any sense of carrying capacities of wooden beams so that lumber was not wasted in such projects. In recent years, I've in fact practiced on my own house with small projects to experiment in order to understand, say, how compound angles were easily completed by ancient carpenters with little training or theoretical knowledge or understanding of formal geometry or sophisticated tools. My uh, book project that Emma just mentioned began really as an illustrated glossary of Latin woodworking terms. And the main text of that book is in some ways an expanded prose introduction to the glossary that now is an appendix to that volume. Now, from the beginning of my investigations into ancient woodworking, I've been interested in naval architecture and the complicated woodworking skills of the shipwright. The woodcraft required to build a ship is about as difficult as anything I've ever observed. There's simply no straightforward 90 degree joinery. And just about every cut involves compound angles. So too, the stresses on the joinery of a ship are ever changing from the buffeting of waves to the tension placed on a keel being dragged up on a beach, the weight of cargo and other factors all require joints that in some cases must be rigid and unyielding and in others quite flexible. My comments today are focused on a small group of finds from one particular shipwreck excavated off the north coast of Cyprus near the port of Kyrenia. And I'll also offer some observations on the method of constructing this Hellenistic period merchant ship and others like it. I should add that this talk is a work in progress. The artifacts I'll be discussing today have not yet been formally published. I'm now preparing the text for the final report. The first volume of the, from the Kyrenia excavations, in fact, is just coming out uh, at the end of this year. I'll have a reference to that at the end of the talk. And there are some tools about which I'm not entirely sure of the function. And I'll happily welcome any of your suggestions or observations. You're looking at a selection of some of the iron finds in this slide uh, you see right here, and just a view of uh, the working situations in the storerooms where the finds from the Kyrenia ship are now kept in Northern Cyprus. Now, I've never experienced the privilege of hands on working with or excavation of the structural remains of an ancient ship, including close study of the joinery. Nevertheless, as an introduction to the topic, 
It's important to point out a few aspects of ancient ship construction that are relevant to the finds from the Crenia ship, from the tools that we'll be looking at more closely in a short while. These basics of ship construction may be familiar to many of you, but I think they are worth repeating. First, Egyptian, Greek, and Roman ships most commonly used one of two forms of hull construction. The first employed a method of sewing the planks together. We saw an example of this uh, practice in the first presentation where the spectacular Royal Nile riverboat excavated at Giza employed sewn planks throughout the ship. And here you see a, one of these beautiful scarf joints from the Khufu ship. This method is not confined to one period or one class of boats. A Roman period ship from the late first century BCE, now on display in Comacchio, Italy, a little bit south of Venice, also a merchant ship, was built with this method of sewn planks. You see a detail of this on the a photograph on the left and a, a kind of closer analytical view of the sewing of these planks of the hull on the right. On a personal note, I can add that I've been building from scratch a small gaff rig sailboat using this ancient technique, but with modern materials a project that I began over 20 years ago, and I must confess, I'm despairing of ever bringing to conclusion. Now, the second method, the second method of hull construction involves the edge to edge joining of the hull planking with hundreds, indeed thousands of mortises and tenons. And here you have a drawing of a couple of planks from the Lake Nemi ships, those great pleasure barges that were built by Caligula and excavated uh, during the Italy's fascist period in the 1920s uh, from Lake Nemi near Rome. And you can see here uh, the planking and here a side view with the, uh, the mortise and tenon joints. Uh, these uh, circular areas are the heads of nails and then it's kind of a top view and you can see how the actual mortises are staggered along the face, uh, the edge faces of the planking. In the most common application that we see here, the tenons take the form of small rectangular tabs of wood that are inserted into the mortises and fixed into place by wooden dowels driven through the planking of the hull. This method of construction was also generally shell first in nature. That is the hull planking was completed first and then the interior bracing, those parts we often refer to as say the ribs of the ship were inserted into the already finished shell of the hull. This was the method used to build the Kyrenia ship. And here I'm contrasting uh, the Nemi ship uh, construction uh, from the mid first century, which you can see on the left with uh, some of the, uh, again, a diagram uh, published in 1985 in American Journal of Archaeology of some of the joinery of the planking of the Kyrenia ship on the right. Uh, what I find interesting here is where we have a scarf joint that is this diagonal here. You can see in the first century, we are using a t a, a mortise and tenon joints, but also nails that are being driven through the edges of the boards here uh, at Kyrenia. Uh, which is, of course, uh, about 300 years older. We're only using the, uh, the mortises to join those. Very secure and very, very labor intensive. The most important uh, woodworking tools to build such hulls, whether sewn or mortised, were the adze, the saw, the drill, and the chisel. The first two cut and shaped the planks and beams. 
Oh, here's another uh, view uh, of a reconstruction of the Kyrenia planking here. With this is uh, when the uh, the ship, as we'll see, was uh, was reconstructed, uh, rebuilt. In a well-known funerary relief in the National Museum of Ravenna in Italy, once the seat of Rome's Adriatic Imperial fleet. We see a shipwright, Publius Longidianus, pushing on with his work, as the inscription tells us. There's a detail of that with Longidianus ad onus properat, which is inscribed into this little panel of the relief, which means, uh, and it says uh, Longidianus is pushing on with his work. Shaping the strake of a ship with his ads, which he holds in his right hand, while he stands on top of his toolbox, using it as a kind of little stepladder. And you can see his toolbox here actually has a little, a prominent little keyhole down in the bottom as well. The tools, of course, as they are today, were very valuable, and he has a lockable box in which to keep them. And we can even see in the relief, as he's using his ads here, some of the cuts on this curved member of the ship that he is working on. Another essential tool of the shipwright, the saw, was one of the earliest of woodworking tools. At least from at least the Greeks and Romans believed that the saw had been invented by that Ur craftsman Daedalus himself when he contemplated the structure of the bone of a fish. Both for ripping long planks, as described last week by Damien Goodburn, and illustrated here from one of my favorite Pompeian mur murals, which shows a procession of carpenters in a parade carrying a float. And we see two little figures up here uh, using a, a frame saw and ripping that plank. This is, by the way, a frieze that has lots to say about the social status of the Fabri Tignuarii, another topic of the status of these workmen that was discussed by Owen Humphreys at our last meeting. And saws, of course, were also essential for the cross-cutting of timbers. Uh, they were indispensable for, uh, for cross-cuts. Here is one of the ceiling planks from the Kyrenia ship, and it still bears a striking image of its saw marks. Another plank uh, from the hull of the ship. In situ on the ocean floor before it was raised to the surface here, shows a, a diagonal scarf you can see here. We just talked about those with the Kyrenia ship, so that diagonal cut there. And interestingly, um, if you can see my cursor here at the bottom of this plank, a row of tacks used to attach sheets of lead to sheathe the aging outer hull of the ship. Now, we had a question a couple of weeks ago during Stefan Moles's talk about the use of tacking, perhaps, to attach fabric to wooden furniture. And this, of course, is not quite the same. We're dealing with, uh, with lead sheets and we're dealing with the hull of a ship. But the concept of using a row of small tacks to, uh, to attach, in this case, a sheathing of lead to the ship is clearly in play here. My report on the tools recovered from the Kyrenia wreck will not unfortunately include any reference to recovered saw blades. The lack is not surprising given the, given the fragility of ancient saw blades in general and the severe corrosion of the iron artifacts that survive from the shipwreck, which I'll be describing in more detail in a moment. The other set of shipboard essentials in terms of woodworking tools, the drill and the chisel, board holes for the twine, or perhaps leather used for binding the planks in sewn construction, or the boring and squaring of the mortises used for the edge-to-edge -edge joinery that I've described. Here I show another remarkable fresco from Pompeii, 
from the so-called Ixion room in the house of the Vedii. This dates from the mid first century. The focus of the scene shows the craftsman Daedalus presenting his invention of a fake cow. You can see the cow is on a stand with little wheels here to Queen Pasiphae, the future mother of the Minotaur. But for our purpose, the detail of greatest interest is found in the lower left-hand corner down here. Where we see Dudless's son, the little Icarus, cutting a series of mortises into a flat board with his mallet and chisel. A bow and drill, you can see, lies at his feet. There's even a small ads plane visible in the lower right corner of this image. And I'm also, I've just slipped in on the right here, uh, a detail of uh, one of the reliefs from Trajan's column, which says some Roman legionaries who were seated at a work table doing the same sort of thing. Uh, this fellow on the uh, left here is about to swing a mallet down to a chisel. These on Trajan's column would have been added as uh, metal attachments to the relief and they're now missing. So we can't actually see the tools, but the pose is quite striking. The scene of Icarus on the left really popped immediately into my mind when we discussed the possibility of children working in carpenters shops. I think it was last week. This woodworking scene is hardly part of the larger myth that uh, we have in the literary record of Daedalus. The painter surely must be drawing upon what must have been a common sight in the woodworking shops of Italy's ancient Campania, a boy working with his father as an apprentice. Speaking of mallets, we should add the mallet and the hammer, and in some cases, the latter tool, I mean the hammer, can be combined with a tool like an adze to the basic kit of the seafarer. And on the uh, top left here, I have just a fragment of what I think is perhaps from an adze blade that was recovered from the Kyrenia wreck. And on the bottom, uh, just a drawing of a combination of an adze and a an hammer from uh, some of the iron uh, work in the collection from the Roman period in the British Museum. Mallets, usually of wood as they still are today, were used to tap the butts of the chisels used to cut the mortises. This beautiful example, shaped from a single piece of wood, was recovered from the Kyrenia shipwreck. That's uh, a photograph of me holding it in the storerooms uh, in Kyrenia. You can beautifully see the rings here. I just love this artifact. It's iron hammers, and here we have a drawing of one of the hammers recovered from the Kyrenia ship, were used to drive metal spikes or nails for attaching interior framing to the planking of the hull. And some form of hammer was needed to drive the dowels through the tenons that were used for the planking. Both the Lake Nemi ship, whose mortise and tenon planking we saw a few minutes ago, and the Kyrenia ship used heavy nails, nails of truly awesome dimension. At Kyrenia, they're made of copper, to affix the frames to the planking of the hull. To give you an idea of how big these are. I show a reproduction of one of these from the Kyrenia ship that was used to attach the planking to the interior framing of the ship. This these uh, were made of copper. Note to the use of a board dowel paired with the spike. You can see I'm holding that in my hand. The danger of splitting boards and strakes, the hull planking, that is, while driving such massive nails 
was avoided by first drilling a hole in the framing member of the ship, then inserting a pre-drilled dowel, and then driving the spike through the dowel. It's really, again, labor intensive and, uh, and really quite, quite interesting. So what about woodworking tools and their presence on ancient shipwrecks? We have to imagine that Greek and Roman seafaring ships, even small ones, the Karenia ship was about 14 meters long and was thought to have had a crew of four sailors on board. Even these smaller ships carried with them the tools and someone on board with the requisite skills to make repairs. When the Kyrenia ship sank at the end of the fourth or the very beginning of the third century BCE, it was already rather, shall we say, long in the tooth. That is, it was old and perhaps near the end of its serviceable life. When the waterlogged planks of the wreck were brought to the surface and later reassembled on shore, many repairs to the framing elements and the planking were observed. And I'm showing again, another illustration from uh, Dick Steffi's article in American Journal of Archeology span in 1985. Part of the keel had been cut out and replaced, for example. And here on the top, you can see just this a section of the keel and you can see there's a notch where it says repair block where uh, a, a new piece of wood had to be inserted to fix a crack in the keel. Some repairs like those to the keel presumably would have to take place when the boat was out of water, but others could be done as part of routine maintenance, even at sea. With this in mind, it makes sense to suspect that any reasonably intact ancient shipwreck excavated from the ocean bottom, or in some cases in Europe, of course, from riverbeds, should reveal a set of ship's carpenter's tools, especially those that comprise the essential group I just outlined a few minutes ago. Now, a few more uh, comments about the Kyrenia wreck itself, and then I'm going to show you just a few examples of some of the tools. The Kyrenia ship was discovered by the Greek diver Andreas Karlou in 1965. The find turned out to be that of a Greek merchant ship that sank at about, as I said, the time of Alexander the Great, or about the time Alexander the Great died, or maybe a, a, a couple of decades, a decade or two afterwards. The ship at Kyrenia was excavated in 1968 and 1969 by a team of nautical archeologists directed by Michael Katsev. Nearly 6,000 wooden fragments were brought to the surface for cataloging and analysis. This included full scale drawings of each piece and eventual reconstruction of the surviving elements of the ship. You see the reconstruction view um, on the left. The timbers were submerged for two years in a solution of polyethylene glycol under the direction of the conservator. Francis Talbot Faciliades. The remains of the ship were reassembled by Richard or known as Dick Steffi in 1974 and can now be seen in Kyrenia's Crusader Castle. At the same time, I should mention the invasion of Northern Cyprus in 1974 by the Turkish military complicated the matters of creating the new museum, studying the objects and various publication schedules. And unfortunately, Michael Katsev died unexpectedly in 2001. His wife and excavation partner, Susan Katsev, along with a core team of the original excavators are now working to bring the meticulously conducted excavations the final publication. The parts of the hull preserved include the entire keel, a good part of the stem, that is the, or the, the framing element of the bow of the ship, as well as 22 strakes of outer planking. 
the predominant wood for the construction of the ship was pine. The hull was, as we've seen, shell first construction. And then those interior cross pieces you see were added. Those framing pieces were of naturally curved timber, not fastened to the keel, but secured to the planking by those large copper nails. And after they were driven through, the tips were bent over. They were clenched, as we say. The interior internal structure included parts of the ceiling. And by the ceiling, I mean the interior planking of a vessel, these types of planks right here. If you can see my cursor. Cross beams and also the mast step. And as I just noted, the, the ship had uh, ev evidently been used for some time. The excavators documented replacements for parts of the frame, several planks. We've mentioned the repairs to the cracked keel uh, and even that layer of lead sheathing over the exterior of the hull, which seems also to have been a late addition. And since the excavation, replicas of the ship had been built. The Kyrenia II was first constructed in 1985 and the restorers used, uh, replicated all the ancient methods of construction. There was a Kyrenia III a few years later in 1988, and the Kyrenia Liberty uh, was in 2002. And I should point out, if you go to Cyprus or you look at some of the Euro coins in your pockets, it's the Kyrenia ship that features on the, uh, on the official Euro currency of Cyprus. Photo of the Reconstructed Liberty, to give you an idea of the scale of this ship. And it's... Okay, a few comments on some of the specific tools. And first I wanna say a few things about the problem of recovering the iron tools from a marine context. The iron tools of the Kyrenia shipwreck uh, corroded over time. The metal reacted with chlorides in the salt water and the sandy seabed. Here you see uh, a tool I'm going to talk about in a moment and a view of the Kyrenia uh, workroom. Over time, a hard shell or concretion formed around the metal artifact. The corrosion continued until only a hollow cavity within the concretion remained in place of the original iron. This cavity acted as a kind of mold into which resin could be poured to create a replica of the original tool. During the Kyrenia excavations, the tools of iron were thus unrecognizable when first excavated. Concretions were identified and they were brought to the surface. The process of casting the impressions left by the iron artifacts within the concretions was undertaken by the Katsefs with a polysulfide flexible mold compound in 1974-1975. Then the original impressions within the concretions were lost when the first castings were extracted because the concretion carapace had to be destroyed. It was pulverized to release the rubber cast. 30 years after the original castings were made in 2004, because the first set of these rubber-like casts were softening and deteriorating, a second set of casts was made by, uh, by uh, using epoxy and the, using the first set to create molds to make a second set of tools. Well, anyway, you can imagine that this recovery process has not made the study of the tools straightforward. In 2018, I worked at Kyrenia with both the original casts and the casts of the casts. I also benefited from the original drawings made by the team when the casts of the tools were first extracted from their concretions. The drawings of which you're seeing today uh, come from those, uh, those originals. Uh, this first tool I'm talking about, I'll have another a slide of it in just a moment. You can see it lying on the table here, the work table. There's its cast, and here's a drawing of that tool. Others you can see are in some of the baskets here. I think that's the mallet that I showed you in that basket uh, far to the right. And of course, many other finds from the ship as well. One of the most remarkable and surely the largest of the tools recovered from the wreck site is this cast of what appears to be an enormous chisel. Uh, 
It is indeed large, even without its handle nearly half a meter in length. In fact, I've been unable to identify anything exactly like it in the archeological record. And I see that uh, uh, Damien Goodburn uh, is here today uh, and, or Owen Humphreys or anyone else uh, might know of a comparable artifact. I'm happy to hear the reference. In form and construction, it is, as I've mentioned, a massive chisel. Traditional carpenters who shape uh, framing timbers call this tool a slick in English, at least in, uh, in, in, in this part of the world. While the handle of the Kyrenia implement did not survive, we can imagine a long handle of wood that was held and operated by both hands. The tool, at least in traditional carpentry, is not struck with a mallet, but pushed at various angles, parallel to the grain of a rough board or even the split surface of a log to smooth the surface to reduce or remove thickness. Now, I find the presence of this tool on the Kyrenia ship of particular interest because it indicates that the crew had the capability of repairing structural elements of the ship, uh, more so than just patching a leak from the rawest of materials while at sea. I should add, by the way, that the tools recovered from the ship all show signs of use, nor do they exist in large numbers to suggest that they were part of the ship's commercial cargo. The location on the seabed near the cabin of the ship and parallels found at other sites, such as those we saw uh, two weeks ago recovered from the late second century CE wreck of the Demirn uh, number one, uh, which was uh, which uh, uh, Stefan Moles uh, showed us some images of, suggests that the woodworking tools were part of the ship's equipment kept in a box or a basket for use as needed. Another artifact uh, recovered from the heavy shell of concretion is relatively familiar as a woodworking tool. Forged from a single piece of iron, its squared butt, tapered shaft, and cutting business end would fit comfortably into a craftsman or able sailor's hand. Unfortunately, the tip of the tool was not recovered during the process of casting. It's closely sim similar to, a, to some tools in the Museum of London, and, uh, and other collections that served as chisel. A particular interest here is the inclusion of an inscription, and you can see the detail that I've uh, blown up on the slide. We can see a triangle with two horizontal uh, bases, like a capital letter A with the base of the letter connected by a horizontal line. The meaning of this is not known. It could easily form a combination of the Greek letters alpha and delta. Uh, it could perhaps be an owner's mark uh, or the mark uh, of a tool maker or have some other significance that we do not know. And I should um, mention that, uh, that there was a, a ruler recovered from a, a ruler, a measuring ruler recovered from the Ma Agon Mikhail shipwreck dated to about 400 BC that uh, also a Greek trading vessel that has an almost identical uh, symbol on it. So this is what we call our mystery object. Among the uh, Kyrenia assemblage is a tool whose function has been subject of debate since just its discovery 50 years ago. The casting process appears to have recovered the original form of this artifact in its entirety. We see a solid iron bar, 15 centimeters in length, with four flat faces. One end of the bar has been forged to create a thick, relatively broad spatula-like form. The center of the space has been pierced with a circular hole. The hole exhibits just a slight taper. The opposite end of the bar, also rectangular in section, but narrower than the spatula side, is fully pierced by a rectangular aperture about midway down the shaft. The two openings, circular and the rectangular, are situated on adjacent faces of the tool so that they are each perpendicular to the other. Our mystery object does share some features with similar tools from post-classical contexts that have been identified as nail headers, including some uh, from the Roman period, as you see here. As the name suggests, the circular aperture aided 
the hammering out of a head during the process of making nails. A feature common to all nail heading tools is a tapered opening so that the shaft of the nail is firmly wedged into place for the shaping of the head by hammering. It's an appealing idea. It's the best I've come up with so far. Um, although the narrow aperture on our mystery tool, and you see a, a model, a replica of it here that I'm holding on the right, does not match the size of nails used to construct the ship. If it did function as a nail heading tool, the nails it produced were used for other purposes. Earlier in this presentation, I noted that one of the tools we can list as essential to the toolkit of the ship's carpenter was a working drill. On this count, the Kyrenia wreck site did not disappoint. The remains of a wooden implement identified as a bow drill were found encased within a large concretion that had developed from and around a group of iron ingots that had been carried in the stern of the ship. The elements released from the corrosion of the iron penetrated the wooden parts of the drill to the degree that when extracted from the concretion, the wood had the characteristics of petrification. The lower half or stock, that's what I'm holding in the photograph and you can see it in the drawing here on the right, of the drill had broken away from the upper part or the nave uh, of the tool. So they were found separately. When the ship sank, these two wooden elements had been joined as the spindle of the stock. That is this projecting element here you can see in the cross section, which is now missing here, can still be observed embedded within the upper nave. Sampling of the wood in terms of species has not been attempted as far as I know due to the state of preservation and the contamination by the concretion. The original tool comprised three components, the iron bit, the stock, that middle part, and the nave, the upper handle. Only traces of the drill bit itself remain in the stock of the drill, down in this area. Although the excavators believe that a small iron cutting tool found separately may have been suitable for the drill, which you see here on the left. The squared tang, the top here, the wider part, the top, prevented the shaft from slipping when under rotation. The body of the wooden stock, so down here, this part, rotated by the friction of a looped cord of twine or leather that was held in tension by a flexed wooden bow or perhaps a human helper who could hold one or even both end of the ends of the cord to spin the, the drill. As the cord moved back and forth, the stock would turn. The hourglass profile of the Kyrenia stock offers an elegant solution for keeping the cord towards the center of the cylinder during the rapid back and forth action of the bow. In a recent experiment using an exact replica of the Kyrenia drill for a master's thesis written by Manuel uh, Berengel, and I'm delighted to see that he is with us today, and I'm deeply uh, grateful to him for supplying some of these images. Drilling was accomplished by effectively, uh, in this case, this experiment, by using a straight staff with a tensioned cord. The hourglass shape of the nave served to cradle the dowel and cord. The Kyrenia drill bears no indication of incisions on the surface of the stock that would have facilitated an optimal degree of friction and traction between the loop cord and the wooden stock during operation. Such incisions have been observed, for example, on a similar drill in the Petrie collection in London. And maybe you can't see them very well, but where the arrows are pointed to uh, little uh, horizontal grooves that actually existed throughout the entire stock of the drill and they've been worn away by use. And on the uh, right here, you see the uh, reconstruction of the Kyrenia drill, again, um, uh, that was undertaken by Mr. Berengel. And again, the topmost component of the tool, smaller in diameter than the stock, referring to this part up here, 
form the handle or the nave of the drill. The Kyrenian nave is tall and slender enough to fit comfortably in the hand. In profile, it takes the shape of a tapering elongated cone, which is finished off with a mushroom cap shaped pommel. A horizontal wooden pin ran off center through the lower part of the nave to serve as a locking device to secure nave and stock together. And I'll describe that in more detail in just a moment. The design of all such ancient bow drills is such that the nave remaining stationary in the hand can be held firmly by the craftsman while the two lower elements, the stock and the bit, move together in a stable clockwise, counterclockwise rotation as they cut into the workpiece. On this point, I digress just for a moment to illustrate a late Roman, probably fourth century, gold glass vessel in the Vatican Museums that shows craftsmen, in fact, probably shipwrights, at work with a series of woodworking tools. The representation of a bow drill here in the sort of at about eight o'clock, if it were a clock face, is unmistakable. But the artist shows the woodworking holding the stock of the drill while using the bow to turn the nave. In other words, <laughs> his hand should be on the top part and the bow should be on the middle or lower part. I think in this case, the artist has just made a mistake unless there's some variant of the drill that's unknown, at least to me. And this example can serve as a reminder that we must be very cautious when we use ancient representations of these tools in use. The quality of the juncture between the spindle and the nave influenced the efficiency of the tool. The connection needed to be snug enough to minimize wobble while the bit rotated, even when under pressure. Sophisticated lathe work on the nave and stock of the Kyrenia drill ensured a snug fit. A circular groove at the top of the stock, you can see it in the cross section here, if you can see my cursor, was matched by a raised ring on the underside of the nave. You can see that in this kind of exploded view and how that fits into that groove there. When joined together, the stock would rotate freely and wobble would have been eliminated. The potential fault of this design would have been increased friction between the nave and the stock. The craftsman must have applied a lubricant at frequent intervals on the groove of the stock and the corresponding ring of the nave. Now, the use of some kind of locking device to prevent the inadvertent separation of the nave and the stock while allowing free rotation is universal in the few extant examples of the ancient bow drill that have survived for us to study today. Without a locking device, it would have not have been possible to extract the drill from the workpiece during operation without the drill falling apart. Just as important would have been the ability to unlock the device so that the nave and stock could be separated easily for lubrication or even the swapping out of parts. The Kyrenia drill offers an ingenious solution that produced a nave, again the upper part, cut, shaped, and drilled from a single piece of wood that once finished could receive a gently tapered spindle. And you see again in Mr. Berengel's reconstruction here, the spindle is this element of the stock I'm referring to, that slipped into place. In this case, a single groove was carefully cut in the cylinder of the spindle, spindle around the axis of rotation. That's this part where my cursor is right here, or you can see it in our diagram here. The off-center horizontal wooden pin that passed to the nave, the pin is shown in the color photograph and in our reconstruction drawing here, and in the section, would have grazed the inserted spindle on a tangent that corresponds to that horizontal groove. The pin, once inserted, prevented the spindle from slipping out of the bottom of the nave. It's impossible to know how widely this method was adapted. There's, there's, uh, it, it seems relatively rare. And those of you who have studied bow drills, um, uh, can perhaps think of some other examples that are similar to this. 
Other bow drills that have been found with both nave and stock intact employ a less elegant solution, but perhaps one less prone to mishap. In some cases, a simple ball and socket joint is created. And here in the color image is a bow drill based upon the Harara drill uh, from Egypt in the Petri collection uh, that was uh, made by one of my students. In order to insert the ball-shaped spindle of the stock into the handle or nave, the nave was cut vertically into two parts. After the ball was placed in one half of the nave, the other half was added and the two sides were bound together with twine. Once again, it was important to use a method that allowed the disassembly of the nave in order to lubricate the spindle or to replace the entire stock. The excavators do not report any traces of the bow from within the concretion or elsewhere from the Kyrenia ship that have been used to operate the Kyrenia drill. This is not surprising considering the relative uh, fragility and perishable nature of the bow and its cord. I hope you don't mind <laughs> that I've discussed the Kyrenia bow drill in such detail. The fact that it was preserved at all is a small miracle, and the sophistication of its design is quite remarkable, as is its presence on a small, common day merchant ship from the Hellenistic period. There were many additional smaller fragments of iron objects, some of them perhaps tools recovered from the Kyrenia ship. I've shown and discussed those I think were essential for the woodworking activities that played a vital role in the routine of running the vessel. Some are easier to identify than others. The beautifully wrought handle depicted here is over half a meter in length. But what was it used for? Is it part of a tool? The small sliver of iron depicted below on this slide, only seven centimeters long, may be a, a molding iron once used with a plane. That any tools have survived, survived for us to study from the Kyrenia excavations is a wonder. The actual objects have been lost to corrosion, and we have only the casts left in the concretions to study. Nevertheless, unlike so many ancient woodworking tools that have been recovered without a solid archaeological context, and I'm thinking here of the many, uh, say, that have been found in the drains and sewers of Roman London, that many of you have looked at or studied. We have here a precious group found more or less in their original context at Kyrenia, and we can date them quite specifically to a particular period of Greco-Roman history. They give us some idea of the capabilities and the expectations that were uh, of, of the uh, ancient mariners. So given the time, I'm going to stop here and I will express my thanks once again to the organizers of the seminar, particularly to Will and Emma, and to those on the Kyrenia excavation uh, team who have given me access to the Kyrenia tools, uh, the original excavation logs, the storerooms of the museum, and their deep knowledge of the history of the project. Uh, thank you all uh, once again. <laughs>